hello everybody and welcome back uh, after the break to our, uh, to our next panel. Um, I'd like to ask you to take your seats and to please turn your phones off or put them on silent. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like you to give a very warm welcome to our second chair today, Professor Laura McAtackney of University College Cork and Our House University, Denmark. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this panel number five, which I am extremely excited about as someone who is very interested in gender history and gender archaeology. So this panel is going to be on gender and violence in Ireland's Civil War, and we've got three of the most important speakers and most important academics doing this kind of work from during the decade of centenaries, but also before. So I think we're really lucky to have um, such a great team, but obviously because our first speaker is a prominent historian of Kerry as well. So who needs no introduction, but I will do it anyway, Miri McAuliffe. So Miri is a Kerry native, as we know. She's an historian and the director of gender studies at UCD. She holds a PhD from the School of History and Humanities, Trinity College, Dublin. And her latest publications include as co-editor with Miriam Houghton and Emily Pine, Legacies of the Magdalene Laundries, Commemoration Gender and the Post-Colonial Carceral State. And as solo author, Margaret Skinner, a biography, she was co-editor of Sexual Politics in Modern Ireland. And with Bridget McAuliffe and Owen O'Shea, co-edited Kerry 1916, Histories and Legacies of the Easter Rising. She's currently writing her much anticipated book on gender and sexual violence during the Irish Revolutionary Period, 1919 to 23, and that will be published next year. And she is past president of the Women's History Association of Ireland and is a member of the Humanities Institute UCD. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and um, um, I'm so delighted you're all uh, sticking here with us on day three of this conference, and I want to pay um, credit to my co-organizers, Owen and Bridget. They really did all the heavy lifting while I spoke from Dublin. And um, uh, it, for, it, it is really them who, who brought all this together, and thank you to Shimsa and, and everybody else if I don't have a chance to say it. So I'm looking at the treatment of militant anti-treaty women in Kerry. And on November the 2nd, 1922, a short article entitled The Lot of Women in Tralee was published in Public Naharan, uh, an anti-treaty newspaper. It referenced the reports in the daily presses of, and I quote, the arrest of free state troops of 10 Tralee girls, which had happened on October the 10th, 1922. However, it is evident that the author of the newspaper noted in his article that the Dublin Guards have failed to terrorize the women of Tralee into forswearing their allegiance to the Republican army by breaking into homes at midnight, dragging them out of their beds, painting their bodies, and heaping upon them every outrage and indignity that only the mentality of the Dublin Guards is capable of devising. So this talk fo focuses on that treatment by, of militant anti-treaty women, women from Cumann mostly, by the National Army during the Civil War. And I think it's important to look beyond what happened to the men, which was we've heard so much about yesterday. Uh, and that history is very important and that trauma. But the women were also deeply involved in, in the anti-treaty campaign in, in Kerry. And concentrating on the experiences of militant and some civilian women from August 1922, when, when the uh, Free State Army lands in Phoenix, to the end of 1923, it explores the anxiety uh, anxieties and misogynistic ideologies uh, which provoked this harsh, gendered and sexual mistreatment of women and the impacts and legacies for militant women in the Irish Free State. So, on the, one of the earliest histories written soon after the Civil War ended, which includes a discussion of women, uh, particularly mil militant anti-treaty women, was P.S. O'Hegarty's uh, The Victory of Sinn Féin, published in 1924. In it, he reserves special vitriol for anti-treaty women. Uh, P.S. did not like the women, whom he regarded as harpies, ill-suited from rational political discourse, and whom he also described as unlovely, destructive-minded, arid begetters of violence, both physical violence and mental violence. This trope of the unrepentant diehard, 
Republican woman, the gun girl, the Amazon, was to create a shaming and silencing around the contribution uh, of and experiences of militant anti-treaty women in the Civil War, which was, la was to last for decades. Publications like my fellow speakers, Gemma Clark's Everyday Violence in the Civil War, looks at the violence against civilians, including women, during 1922 and 23. However, this is one of the few books that forefronts that sort of histories, because most of the histories concentrate on what historian John Regan calls the exceptional incidences of violence. And they're important, like our Bally CD or Clash Melkin, as Fanula talked about today. But Regan and others do not include gendered attacks on women by officers and men of the National Army in the list of exceptional incidences of violence. However, I would argue here that the violence against women in Kerry from the arrival of the National Army, and especially the arrival of the Dublin Guard, was brutal, persistent, and continuous, being a specific tactic of the army to contain the threats posed by the militant anti-treaty women. Therefore, this violence against militant women in the Civil War has to be understood as part of a systemic and fundamental process of gendered violence in war, and as being on a continuum of gendered and sexual violence against women, which marred both the War of Independence and the Truce period. And all armed men, our armed gangs of men, were involved in this from the IRA during the War of Independence. You see it again in the Truce period in Northern Ireland when there's a spike in gendered violence from the B Specials and Orange Gangs. Uh, and in the Civil War, it's the National Army. In Kerry, the majority of coming on were anti-treaty. Of the 154 military pension applications for Kerry Cumann Amon, currently on the Military Archive site, 139 mention Civil War uh, anti-treaty activities. From August 2nd, 1922, Kerry Cumann Amon were active on the anti-treaty side. Tralee Cumann Amon talk about preparing Tralee for the coming of the uh, uh, um, National Army who were marching in from Phoenix, and then uh, going with the IRA on that tactical retreat. And they become a thorn in the side of the National Army and a particular irritant for General Paddy O'Daly, who was from January 1923 the officer commanding of Kerry Command. From that period, most of the urban centres are under the control of the National Army, but the countryside remains dangerous for them as anti-treaty IRA units are patrolling constantly, aided by the intelligence gathering and dispatch carrying and arms uh, um, carrying of the common man. While the anti-treaty men were on the run, most of the women remained in their homes, watching the barracks and activities of the National Army, providing intelligence, carrying dispatches, setting up printing presses, and propaganda is very, very important, as I'll talk about. And they are producing anti-treaty propaganda. However, unlike the Crown forces during the War of Independence, O'Daly and his officers were quick to recognize the importance of women to the anti-treaty cause because, of course, as members of the squad in Dublin, they had worked with common among women in their activities and they knew what they could do. Understanding this, their callous treatment of common among women would escalate quickly to violence in the autumn of 1922. Killarney was taken by the National Army in August 13, 1922. A few weeks later, an Irish independent report of September 14th 22, outlined an incident which occurred in Killarney with the headline, Shocking Kerry Outrages. On that Friday night, it was reported that the residences of six young ladies, who were known to have sympathies with the irregulars, were visited by armed and masked men. Dragging the women out of their beds, the raiders painted their bodies with green paint. The outraged girls gave evidence that the men were dressed in green coats and they left behind a card in each house which read, dispatch carriers beware. To publicly shame them, the six girls were warned not to stay at home the next day, which had a twofold object, uh, and I quote from the newspaper, to expose the girls to the mockery of those in the know and to provide a cover up for the attack as the women would be seen going about their normal business so their story of an outrage would be thought to be a fabrication. The intention, the intention here was twofold, terror and shame. Terrorised the common Amman women, anti-treaty women, into halting their work with Republicans and shame them in front of their community. A report on the same incident appeared in the National Anti-Treaty uh, News Sheet, Public Naharan, on September 18, 1922, where it is called a cowardly outrage 
uh, which was an indication, and I quote, of the type of men who were recruited into the Free State Army. It noted that O'Daly had promised to find and punish the culprits. However, as the author further noted, and I quote, of course, they are in his barracks. He can discover the criminals if he wants to, or if his government will let him. We await the result. And of course, there's no result. Similar to what happened later on in the terror months, there's a cover-up. There isn't even an inquiry here. They just, it just goes away. The author was right about to be skeptical about the results of O'Daly's inquiry into the incident, if indeed it ever happened, um, as it was most likely that the attack was unofficially sanctioned by National Army officers in, uh, in Killarney, including the senior intelligence officer, David Nelligan, known for his brutality, and possibly by O'Daly himself. A further piece of evidence, and this is the layering of evidence, comes from one of the victims in her pension statement, Elizabeth Lottie Dunn, nee Foley of Killarney Branch of Cumannamon. Foley, or Dunn as she became, joined Cumannamon in 1917 and was very active during the War of Independence. Taking the anti-treaty side, she was one of the six women attacked. She's, this incident is measured in her uh, pension application several times. She wrote that she was raided at night by Free State soldiers and was compelled to allow them to remove clothing while my body was painted. This, she wrote, was a reprisal for carrying dispatches, and because of that assault, she writes, she suffered nervous upset. The language used in this reporting of the incident and in the pension application is one uh, is typical of language used in reporting of gendered and sexual attacks during the War of Independence. A shocking affair, an outrage, an assault. This all indicates that this was a serious incident, but the experience of and impact on women is masked using neutral language. Outrage is used for a multitude of things. It can be the burning of houses, the taking of cattle, stealing of possessions, uh, as well as attacks on women and sexual assaults. In looking at the incident in Killarney, we know that at the very least, six young women were assaulted by five or six armed men, stripped naked, and had their bodies painted. The incident indicates serious sexualized assault, and it's quite possible that what happened went even further. Even though Lottie Dunn later wrote, and this is backed up by her referees, that the assault impacted on her emotionally and psychologically, like many women, she shied away from the use of more concrete terms for sexual assault. Nor did the violence against militant women happen in their homes. Many were also arrested and subjected to brutal and degrading and demeaning treatment during imprisonment. One example, on November 27, 1922, a dozen women are arrested after a week, uh, arrested and spend a week in Moiderwell Jail, when they are then taken to Blennerville and they're put on an old cattle boat bound for Dublin. Nora Brosnan writes, one of the arrested, that it was a terrible voyage. The whole lot of us were seasick for three days and had no food at all. The treatment of Kerry women transferred to Kilmainham and then the North Dublin Union was like all, of the, all the militant women prisoners in those places, rough and brutal sometimes. Hannah McCann of the Ballymacalligate branch says her time in Tralee and Kilmainham jails left her broken in spirit. Lizzie O'Donnell, who was arrested with a big bag of, bag of bombs, as she said, in camp, wrote that her health was altogether impaired and for a long time I was unable to do any work. Sheila O'Connell from Tralee, who was removed to Kilmainham on that cattle boat, was badly mistreated in Kilmainham. On one occasion, she was dragged and kicked down an iron stairway, as she says, which caused an injury to her side, including her womb. But the threat of arrest did not stop many of the Kerry coming on, much to O'Daly's disgust, and they continue their work into 1923. Perhaps the most public part of their work is propaganda, creating anti-treaty propaganda, producing news sheets, and writing up things on the walls. In March 1923, uh, Nora Hurley, Hannah Moynihan, Margaret and Theresa Power, or Sis and Joe Power, as they are known, all of Tralee Cumannamon were arrested for preparation and distribution of uh, typewritten irregular propaganda around the town. In their memoirs, the two women here, Sis and Joe Power, uh, their memoir, which I love the title of, Blaze Away With Your Little Guns, the Power Sisters describe their propaganda activities. They help produce the Invincible, which they sent to the Free State Officer in, in command. You can imagine how that impacted on O'Daly. O'Daly's report on March 14th to GHQ compa complained about female irregular sympathizers, whom he said were an absolute menace, 
and were flooding the country with vile, lying propaganda. Of course, they were reporting on Balisidi and the other atrocities. Two days later, his men arrested three active members of Kumanaman, prominently identified with irregular propaganda. And on March 21st, he was happy to report, he said, that Mary McSweeney's disciples are still to the fore, distributing propaganda, but the Invincible had been shut down. Other aspects of women's militant work was related directly to the events of the Terror Month. Kathleen Walsh, whom those of you who were here last night would have seen in the Ballycedy documentary, wrote the note that brought the men, uh, the National Army soldiers and Knocknagoshals to Baranarig Wood, where they were blown up by the trap mine. Uh, the National Army, in its sweep through Knocknagoshal as part of reprisal and brutality, when, as Dermot Ferritter wrote, the deaths of the National Army soldiers unleashed a lust for revenge, arrested Kathleen Walsh and her three sisters, Joan, Bridie, and Eileen. As J and, and one of the men there was Lieutenant Jeremiah Gaffney, who had gained a notor notoriety for brutality among Republican men and women, and indeed would be executed uh, in 1924 for the killing of Tom Brosnan in Scarta Glen in 1923, late 1923. J.J. Barrett wrote in his memoir, In the Name of the Game, that Kathleen had written the note with her left hand to disguise her handwriting, but when she was arrested and taken into Hartnett's Hotel, the headquarters in Castle Island, and interrogated after the explosion, she referred to her, not, her normal handwriting with her right hand. Despite their inability to connect Kathleen's handwriting to that on the note, she and her sisters had their heads shaved under torture, and that's a very prosaic statement. What was the, tor the torture that they were enduring? We will never know, because Kathleen immigrated uh, to the USA, where, as J.J. Barrett said, she died prematurely in 1940. Forcible hair cropping had been a significant type of gendered violence during the War of Independence in Kerry and elsewhere, and Kerry was one of the places where it was most widespread in 1920-21. However, by the autumn of 1922, it, had really, it was really not a feature of what the National Army was doing, although there were a few incidences around the country, but here in Knocknagoshal, they used it again, and you can see there were exceptions to that. So through the terror months, militant women and their families of Republican men were targeted by the National Army. The desire to seek revenge and contain and control the women of Cumannaman is obvious from communiques from O'Daly to GHQ in Dublin. Um, in May 1923, he wrote that a general roundup of these women is essential. Consideration of their sex should not be entertained for a moment. The women, he said, were keeping the flag flying in the way of propaganda, and they were looking for trouble and should get it. O'Daly's anger and loathing of women who crossed him would boil over into the mistreatment of two non-militant women in an attack in Kinmare in June 1922, the infamous Kinmare case. Dr. La Randall McCarthy lived there with his wife and two daughters, Florence and Jessie. Um, he had served in the Royal Medical Corps, and so these were a very respectable family. His daughters had not been involved in coming on during the revolutionary period, but they were associating with uh, Niall Harrington, who you would have seen in the Bally CD documentary last night, and um, Michael Higgins, a relation of Kevin O'Higgins, and some other officers of the uh, National Army, who were uh, antagonistic towards O'Daly and the, the murder squad that formed part of the Dublin Brigade, a guard in, in, um, in Kerry. Uh, on the night of June the 2nd, a loud knocking came at Erinville, the home of the McCarthys, and an armed man with a torch demanded entry. Uh, the girls were dragged out by three men into the garden where they were flogged with a Sam Brown belt and had their hair covered with thick, thick motor grease or dirty motor oil uh, into their hair and faces. The effect of the motor grease subsequently caused their hair to fall out in clumps. The three men identified in the attack were Major General Paddy O'Daly, Captain Edward Flood, and Captain Jim Clark, which is interesting because Flood and Clark are the two men who were, who were most closely associated on the National Army side with carrying out the Ballycedy massacre. So you can see there is a, a brutality and violence that's just a normal, normalized part of their response to both men and women in Kerry at this time. According to John Regan, there is an implicit suggestion of sexual assault, but we get a more direct quote from Bill Bailey, a Tralee native and a, a, who had joined the National Army once it had come to uh, Kerry in August 22. In an interview with Ernie O'Malley, he referred to the Kenmare incident. Uh, 
He said that Flossie and Jessie McCarthy were nice girls who were doing a line with two young officers, Harrington and Higgins, which appeared to enrage Daly, uh, Clark and Flood. Bailey reported that the three men left the barracks in Kinmare, went to McCarthy's house, attacked the girls, said they raped them. So we have direct evidence that that was most likely a sexual assault. This attitude of brutal and unrelenting antagonism towards militant women and some non-militant women continued to be dangerous. A letter sent from a person in Listowel to GHQ, to President, uh, sorry, to President D.H. W.T. Cosgrave's uh, office, detailing the National Army's discipline situation in Kerry, which was described as very bad, particularly in relation to the conduct of soldiers with reference to girls. In particular, sentries in Listowel would refuse to allow girls pass without kissing them, which indicates constant street harassment of women by soldiers. While this in incident was described as notorious and was bad towards civilian women, those perceived to be on the anti-treaty side came in for much harsher treatment. Militant anti-treaty women were not amongst those executed or tied to mines or shot in extrajudicial killings, although there is a killing of a young woman in late 1923. Um, accidental killing it was taken as, but she did, she was a diehard. The violence visited on them through their experiences in prison, through raids and reprisals, verbal and physical abuse, gendered and sexual attacks, has to be seen in the context of misogyny and brutality. O'Daly and his men recognized the vital contribution of women to the anti-treaty cause. They denigrated and demeaned it in their reports. They insulted these women, they beat and humiliated them. They forcibly hair-cropped and sexually assaulted them, and they imprisoned and mistreated them. The assaults on the six common women in Killarney in 1922, the brutal imprisonment of women from October of that year, the forcible hair-cropping of the Walsh sisters in March 23, and the Kinmare incident in July 23, among so many other gendered attacks on women, might be called exceptional moments or incidents of violence, like the extrajudicial murders of anti-treaty men or the massacres of prisoners in March 1923. However, when analyzed through a gendered lens, the violence against women in Kerry during the uh, Civil War has to be, I would argue, to be understood as on a continuum of tactical, systemic, degrading, verbal, physical, gendered, and sexual mistreatment of militant women by armed male groups during this period, and it is deliberate. In conclusion, the trauma effects, uh, sorry, the trauma effects of this was to be long-lasting, blighting the lives and afterlives of many women, and most especially the common man women. Now with access to the archives, such as the military pension application files, we can revisit the period and use gender as a necessary lens of analysis of violence in the revolutionary period more broadly, and in the Civil War in particular. The violently misogynistic attitudes to militant and political women would persist in, on into the coming decades and one impact on the treatment of all women in the Irish Free State. What we can understand is that gender-based violence was as much a part of the Irish Revolutionary Wars, 1919 to, 20, to 1923, as it was in all wars and revolutions of that period, and which unfortunately, as we see, in Ukraine and other places today, continues to be the reality of war from women and girls uh, in, in our contemporary period. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mary. That was fascinating. I'm looking forward to the questions afterwards. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Dr. Margaret Ward, who again needs no introduction, but I will continue anyway. Um, who's one of the most important uh, gender historians of Irish history and has been for a very long time. She's an honorary senior lecturer in history at Queen's University Belfast and has a PhD from the University of West of England and an honorary doctor of law uh, from the University of Ulster for her contribution to advancing women's equality. Amongst her many publications are Maud Gone, A Life, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, Suffragette and Sinn Féinor, her memoirs and political writings, Fearless Woman, Hen Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, Feminism and the Irish Revolution, and her incredibly important and pioneering book, Unmanageable Revolutionaries, Women and Irish Nationalism, which was first published in 1983 and was republished in a revised and updated edition by Arlen House in 2021. Thanks, Margaret.
thank you, Laura. And thank you so much, Mary and Bridget and Owen, for having invited me here to this fantastic conference with terrific papers that I've been really enjoying. Um, Coming a man member from Belfast, Nora Quinn, met Daniel McCarthy from Castle Island, Kerry, in uh, 1918. He was incarcerated in Crumlin Road Jail at the time uh, during the German uh, plot roundup. And um, they fell in love and got married in 1922. And later on, in October 1922, Nora says in her pension application she was transporting arms from the north down to Kerry. Um, Daniel took the anti-treaty side and was very involved. He'd been involved in the volunteers since 1914. He was involved in all of the um, irregular um, activities around Tralee in the 22-23 period. He said that um, as a farmer's son, he lost the farm to his younger brother because he hadn't been able to work on the farm because of his revolutionary activities. And very, and I would imagine Kerry was not a, a very friendly place to um, anti-treaty volunteers in, in the time after the Civil War. So he moved to Belfast in 1923 uh, with Nora and stayed there, which I think is unusual. Belfast wouldn't be somewhere you would think um, known Republicans would have moved. And although they both got pensions, Daniel complained that his grade E pension was much lower than that of his comrades, and he blamed that on the fact that he was very isolated in the North and hadn't been able to make contact with former comrades. So that's my only Kerry reference in my paper uh, today. But it does show that there are those kinds of connections. Um, Republicans were moved a lot, particularly the, uh, in terms of imprisonment, and women all over the place were there uh, to look after them. But my focus is the women of Belfast come in the man and trying to uncover what has been a very hidden history nor is also unusual, I think, in marrying so many of the women that I've been studying and trying to find out more about never did marry. So what we have on the North at the moment are primarily books on the Northern IRA, very little on Kamen Amman. Um, these, are some of the, these are the books that have come out. Even Brian Feeney, uh, the one on Antrim and the Irish Revolution, which is written with much greater access to pension files, only has two pages on women, and that, that's on the women in the glens of Antrim. He doesn't mention the women in Belfast. Um, Kieran Glennon's book um, is very much focused on his grandfather, Tom Glennon, and Jim McDermott writes of the activities of his grandfather and granduncle. They were brothers who took opposite sides of the treaty, so those were very much focused on the Glennon and McDermott families. So going to the pension files, if one does a global search, you can find, if you go into gender, female, Northern Ireland, 128 names. And then if you drill down beyond that, you get 74 for gender, female, County Antrim, and only 37 for Cumann Amman, County Antrim. And this, of course, includes not only Belfast, but areas like Ballycastle and Cushendall. And to complicate matters, parts of South Belfast are listed as being county down. And there's no nominal role for Belfast. There's a note in the files, in the pension files, dated from November 1939, that Emily Valentine and Agnes McCulloch would establish a common Amman brigade committee that would send in the required organisation records without delay, but it didn't happen. Neither of the women lived in Belfast at this time and hadn't been involved in Belfast common Amman for a considerable time. However, there was an attempt made in 1937 by Sean O'Neill, who'd been the first OC of the 3rd Northern Division to identify the women. And this comes from the Dennis McCullough papers that are in uh, UCD archives. And I'm very grateful to Helga Wagen for uh, giving me um, this particular um, copy of the files. But all the names that Sean O'Neill has listed and have been added to on that list are those women who made pension applications. What we don't know is the names of those who didn't make an application. And we can also see the difficulties coming among women in the Northeast had when we compare the numbers of women 
um, in branches compared to the population elsewhere. So um, Cal McCarthy's very valuable book on Cumanaman and the Irish Revolution, you can see Munster um, very much an active, as we've just heard from, from Mary, uh, a branch of Kamanaman to just under 3,000 members in the population. And then you look down at the provinces and you come to Ulster with its very large unionist population, only has one branch to 35,000 in the population. And constructing a full picture of the work of Belfast Cumanaman is even more difficult because many didn't make a, pen, a, a claim for a pension. Maybe they didn't need the income, but that's very unlikely. Most of the women um, who had a job found that they had lost their job because of their activities. As I say, most seem to have remained unmarried, but it's much more likely that they were unreconciled to the existence of the free state. Annie Ward, who was the OC of Central Branch, Kamanaman, provided a lot of references for former comrades, but she never applied on her own behalf. And Cassie O'Hara, who had been the fiancé of Joe McKelvey, the OC of the Third Northern Division, who took the anti-treaty side and was executed by the Free State Government on the 8th of December 1922, was another prominent figure who chose not to apply. Now, we know Cassie remained an active Republican because she was interned by the Stormont Government in the 1940s. And some who did apply made plain their hostility to the Free State. Molly Kerr, appealing her claim, said, I may say this, had the late Joseph McKelvey been alive, I could have given much more proof than I did of my activities. Nellie O'Boyle, whose very typical response as well, said she hadn't replied, uh, applied previously due to the fact she was still a Republican and her oath forbade me to recognise the Pensions Act. I took an oath, she said, to the Republic on Cave Hill in the company of the late Sean McDermott, Bulmer Hobson and Seamus McKenna, uh, somebody who had been a very long-living, a long-lasting Republican. And another major difficulty regarding source material is the fact that Northern women didn't publicise their activities even years after they had taken place. Come and Amman, you have to remember, remained a prescribed organisation under the Special Powers Act from 1922 until the Act was abolished in 1973, following the imposition of direct rule on Northern Ireland, so that those making pension applications were often afraid to post their forms from within Northern Ireland as the post could be opened and there was the ever-present fear of internment. And a lot of them write in their letters to the pension assessors that they were waiting uh, till somebody crossed the border to post the letter on their behalf. And just one example, Mrs. McNulty, who's not from Belfast, but from Tyrone, the president of the Dromore branch of Cumanaman, she was writing to the pension assessors in November 1938 after attending a meeting in Dublin about her claim. And she says in it, she talks very much about, first of all, going back to the dear old North in a very sarcastic tone, but she says, I think the people of the free state and some of those in Dublin forget we've not gained our freedom yet, we are still suspects. But apart from hoping and praying for a pension for active service, I would consider my life well spent if I could, could discover some plan or persons who could make public the fight we had in this district around Dromore. Unfortunately, we northerners cannot brag. We are still patiently waiting for De Valera to do something for us. It's hardly just to allow a handful of Orangemen to subject us to all sorts of per petty persecutions. And I just want to say a few words about the violence of Belfast at this time. Mary's mentioned some of the um, gendered violence against women in terms of, of hair cutting and assault. But in, in, in more general terms, there were more women were killed in Belfast than anywhere else. I mean in terms of civilian population. In just under two years, between July 1920 and June 1922, 78 women died in violent incidents directly arising from the political situation, and 73% of those were nationalists. And it was a very random nature in, in terms of killing. Kieran Glennon in the, the um, 
the, the, the website, The Irish Story, which John Dorney um, curates and which I, I thoroughly recommend. Kieran has a, a very useful set uh, of statistics looking at the killings and he says that on the 5th of October 1922 a Catholic woman Mary Sherlock went to buy food for her family's dinner as she queued in a butcher's shop in East Bel Belfast a predominantly Protestant area a gunman walked up behind her and shot her in the head she was the 498th person to be killed and the final fatality of the pogrom Catholic workers were also expelled from their jobs, and it's not just male shipyard workers were expelled. That's always been the focus of attention. Obviously, 8,000 of them were expelled, but there were also 1,800 women textile workers, and there were also male and female workers from Gallagher's Tobacco Works who were expelled from their jobs. And many of the individual women from Belfast, Cum and Amman testified to losing their jobs as a result of their activities and not being employed again in the future. It's been said you had to be brave to be an active Republican in Belfast. Breesh McCampbell, who lived on the Orma Road, which was a mixed area, uh, had her family put out of their home in the 1920 pogrom. Two years later, they were then put out of their home on Raglan Street off the Falls Road. And to quote from her pension application, our house was taken from us and we had to leave in 1922. The house, furniture and everything we had was put on the street about five minutes before curfew and we had to come to Dublin. Emily Valentine's family home in Hanover Street in Belfast was burnt in the pogrom of 1922 by what she called the mob because of the family's continuous assistance to the Republican cause. They left for Dublin with little or nothing and didn't return. Alice Flynn wasn't a member of Cumminaman, but she was attached to the 1st Brigade of the 3rd Northern Division, working with her husband, Thomas, who was its intelligence office, officer. She said their home wasn't a safe place after her husband's arrest in 1922. So, uh, Alice was arrested and held for a short time. She then left for the relative safety of the Glens of Antrim and stayed there until her husband was released in 1924. So looking at Cumminaman activity in the north, by 1920 there were three branches in Belfast. There was Central under Anne Ward, West Belfast under Elizabeth Delaney, and North Queen Street, a later branch headed by Elizabeth Corr, but they struggled to perform their duties in a very hostile environment. The North Queen Street branch had to close in 1921 to quote, because of the disturbed state of the town, defection of members, it made it impossible to carry on work any longer, said Elizabeth Corr. Um, we don't know the numbers in Belfast, it's somewhere between 100 and 150 at its height, we would reckon. So for the rest of the paper, I want to explain why it has the title I gave it by describing briefly some of the stark differences in the experiences of Republicans in Ulster, particularly in the North East, compared to the rest of the county in the country during the period of the Truce Treaty and subsequent Civil War. Maggie Fitzpatrick was a member of Central Branch since May 1916. She was highly involved in moving arms and sending dispatches because she worked for the Socialist Republican Danny McDevitt, who had a tailoring business in Rosemary Street in the centre of Belfast, and it provided ideal cover, and basically they operated a huge arms dump. She continued that work after McDevitt was interned in 21, but she said in her pension interview that during the truce period, she shifted arms less frequently and Cumminaman work was carried out with great difficulty as the principal job was saving their own hides. So it's obvious that the history of Northern Republicanism differs vastly from those in the 26 counties. For example, there was no celebration and no end to violence with the truce. The truce started on the eve of the 12th of July 1921 and in the north you had the Protestant population on holiday, a lot of alcohol around and highly sectarian speeches from Orangemen. It unleashed what Brian Feely has described as a frenzy of violence. 150 nationalist homes in Belfast were burnt out on the 10th of July alone and the violence continued over the following days and you can see the Cumminaman members were very much affected by that. And everyone was in agreement that the truce never operated in Belfast. 
Donegal man Dennis Houston was released from Crumlin Road Prison on the 11th of July and escorted by Cumberland member Mona Delaghi, uh, first of all to her house for a bite to eat and then to the train station. He described an orgy of destruction and violence with all the passengers passengers on his tram journey having to lie flat on the floor to avoid flying bullets and glass. Agnes O'Boyle, who was an IRA member from London, uh, very much involved in moving arms to the north, moved to Belfast with her husband, a post office employee, and she said that she was very clear that the truce never operated in Belfast and that the period was what she described as periods of intense activity of a defensive and offensive nature against the forces of the government of Northern Ireland by the IRA. And the Unionist government had been shocked by the truce because Owen O'Duffy had been appointed IRA liaison officer and sent to the North to negotiate on equal terms with the British Army and the RIC, and in Unionist eyes, that was to give recognition to the IRA. They had believed that the six counties, which now had its own parliament, would be outside of these negotiations. So their response was to argue with the British government that the Ulster Special Constabulary had to be mobilised against the Republican threat, an internment used to put down opposition to partition, and also it was hoped to drive away the Catholic middle class, um, the leadership given to, to the nationalists. Now, at the treaty, Kamen Aman rejects the treaty. It's the first organisation to do so. And during that convention, the North, unlike, the, I think, the debate in the Doyle, the North really was a factor in this. Leslie Price Barry, for example, who is now the wife of Tom Barry, but she had worked in Belfast um, uh, prior to 1916 and had been involved in Belfast Kamen She said that the treaty let down the people of the North and you can see their, 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 um, their statement that, their, their, uh, that comes out of the Cumberland Convention that they want to reimpose the Belfast boycott unless the prisoners in northern jails are released. At that time, three prisoners in Derry jail were about to be executed. Um, and Elizabeth Corr uh, from Belfast was solidly anti-treaty. She wasn't a delegate at the convention, but she uh, was there as an observer, and she wrote from the gallery an account for the press. And it's hard to make it out there. I think it's from the Irish News, but you can see it's called a Belfast Visitor's Impression. Again, an anonymous account. People didn't give their names. And she talks about when Jenny Wise Power finally, who was pro-treaty, makes a statement, you have seen the British troops going. She's greeted with cries of no, with the Northern delegates shouting out that they were being drafted into the six counties. We want a republic, nothing else. And significantly, Northern delegates never gave their names, and they're not minuted in the Cumberland Convention reports because of the dangers they faced, unlike other members who are minuted. So during this period, the IRA is busy increasing its supply of arms as part of Michael Collins' anti-partition drive, and there's a secret arming of the IRA in the North as preparation for a Northern offensive. And Collins' plan was to unite the pro and anti-treaty uh, forces in a common goal. Both sides of the IRA agreed to attack British forces in the North. So in preparing for the Northern offensive, it was to start in May 1922, but actually what happened was that it was swiftly followed by what everyone called the Big Roundup. And so the terminology is very different from standard histories of this period. Those living in areas west of the Ban and in South Armagh, South Down, pinned their hopes on this northern offensive to challenge partition, or at least having the boundaries of the north redrawn through the offensive. But for those in County Antrim, which was a majority Unionist county, it was very different. How could they challenge Unionist rule and partition? As Feeney remarks, the Third Northern pinned a lot of hopes on Collins and his plans for insurrection in the North. But the Belfast Brigade of the IRA was in a very different position, to quote John O'Neill. It had to carry out urban guerrilla raids and attacks alongside mounting an almost continual defence of some districts against intensive communal attacks by heavily armed unionists. So it's all, although their activities are not acknowledged in the existing text 
about the period, it's obvious from the evidence of the pension applications that women played an important part in the movement of arms from south to north and moving arms north to south. As Collins sent arms supplied to the provisional government by the British to the north, swapping these for northern arms. Alice Flynn was in involved in preparing for the big offensive by moving arms from Dundalk to Belfast 12 or 13 times and from Belfast to County Antrim three or four times. Amy Murphy went to Dundalk for arms seven times in 1922 using disguises of glasses and different hats and coats to get through the security barriers at the station. During that May and June, Theresa McDevitt bought arms and ammunition, including a box of grenades and dispatches from Joe McKelvey and others to Charlie Daly and Owen O'Duffy at their headquarters in Draperstown, County Derry. James Heron, who is in D Draperstown, said she carried arms for us through cordoned areas when it was impossible for us to do so ourselves. Seamus McGurran, who had been a member of the Belfast Brigade and ended up as a Major General in the Free State Army, gave a reference for Bridget Woods, describing the difficulties women faced when transporting armaments by train, to quote, the nationalist area of the city was heavily patrolled by military and police cordons were established at traffic junctions and pedestrians, trams and other vehicles were halted and searched. In the north, we had two categories of police unknown in other parts of the country, namely the A and B specials. These were, if possible, more undisciplined than the others and with their local knowledge and intense bigotry, a train searched by them would have been a frightening experience, if not worse, for ladies carrying rifles in a rug. So on the northern offence of Belfast hadn't received all of its supplies, and they asked for a postponement of the offensive. That meant that attacks mounted by different divisions and brigades took place at different times in Tyrone and Derry. And the Ulster Special Constabulary were able to overwhelm them because of their greater numbers and superior firepower. The Belfast and Antrim brigades did then mount their attacks, starting with Musgrove Street barracks and an arson campaign against businesses, including mills and department stores and the mansions of wealthy unionists. Train loads of specials poured into Belfast as a result. Some of the Antrim brigade hid out in the glens where they were totally dependent on Cumminamon for food and support until they were able to move south. Mary McCarry of Ballycastle described providing food, clothing and shelter for the remains of the flying column and safeguarding them as far as possible until July 1922 when the men left for the Curra. The Special Powers Act had become operational on the 22nd of May and the IRA, FINA and Cumminamon were now illegal organisations and internment was introduced. The homes of Republican activists were raided throughout the six counties in a big roundup. Some crossed the border and sought, sought refuge in the Free State. Around 500 of those interned were moved to the prison ship, the Argenta. Around 26,000 to 30,000 left the North between May and June 1922 in what the late Morris Hayes has termed the second flight of the Earls. It certainly was the case that the Belfast middle class and other middle class members moved, those with money uh, who, and who were able to set up businesses elsewhere found it easier to move than working class Republicans. When the IRA split in June 1922, the joint policy on the North was at an end. After Collins was killed in August, Roger McCauley, one of the most active of the Belfast IRA, said those in the North gave up all hope. Those still active in Cumminamon spent their time raising funds for the prisoners and distributing funds to their dependents. Una McCrudden, in this winter of 22 and 23, said she was very busy collecting money for the Republicans. This was the most difficult time as so many former friends had become enemies owing to the split. I continued to work until the end of 1923. Collecting for prisoners, I had to hold very much against my will a hundred and something pounds and to distribute it. It meant long, weary journeys on foot and it was cold weather. These are the Brady sisters. Now, Frances Brady, during the Civil War, carried dispatches and was in touch with people in Dublin, Belfast, Dundalk, Derry and Newry. She returned to Belfast at the time of her sister Kay's arrest in Dublin on March 23 
And uh, she then, Frances became secretary for the Irish Republican Prisoners Dependence Fund, taking over for, for, from Winifred Carney. She also took charge of the distribution of Republican papers, Sinn Féin and ERA throughout Belfast. Molly Kerr was arrested. Her home was raided in June 22, and she was arrested when a letter containing a blank check for an IRA member was found. She was interned in Armagh till 7th of December 22. During her imprisonment, she said her home was looted and she lost her belongings. She was then deported from IRA from Northern Ireland after her release and relocated to Dublin. So many Republicans were served with barring orders from the uh, Northern government, unable to cross the border home. Winifred Carney, who had been, as you know, in the GPO with Connolly, remained an active Republican all this time, worked very closely with the IRA, was arrested on the 25th of July, but released after 18 days in Armagh on the grounds of ill health. Rose Black, who'd, all read, who'd already served a term in imprisonment, was now served with an internment order in February 23, but released under doctor's orders because she'd become almost blind due to her earlier imprisonment, and she got a wounds claim for her bl blindness. Nora Boyle was arrested in Cavan, having been sent there by a Belfast IRA member, and was held in the North Dublin Union until November 23. Northern women also fought in the Civil War in the South, especially those who had been forced south, like Breach McCampbell, who spent five days in Barry's Hotel and then did dispatch work until the end of 23. Emily Valentine, who'd also had to move to Dublin after her house was burnt, was stationed in Parnell Square at the start of the Civil War, and then she delivered dispatches until she was arrested and interned in North Dublin Union. Nellie O'Boyle brought munitions from Belfast to Dundalk for use of the Belfast Column and made four trips there. She also carried dispatches to Derry, so she said she couldn't get anyone to deliver them as the men were all on the run. And there were other women as well that I won't go on now. But just to go back um, to the sisters, uh, the Brady sisters, who are really important. They get pensions which are grade D, uh, which most common among members don't get, and they get kind of full pensions for, for uh, um, uh, as long as, the, you know, seven years, um, five years, etc. They were initially from Belfast, but Kathleen Brady uh, bought a flat in Lower Leeson Street when she left Belfast in 1920, and the Belfast boycott was carried on from there. Kathleen, in the Civil War, bought arms from Belfast to Dundalk with the Belfast Column, and moved to Dun when, when they moved to Dundalk Barracks. She then reported for duty at Barry's Hotel, she later transported arms to Dundalk, Lisbon and Belfast before being arrested in March 23, imprisoned in Kilmaine and the North Dublin Union. She escaped from jail, which I think you expect her to do because these are women who looked like um, they, would, they, they, they would be pretty tough. Um, and so I really, the, 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 the picture on the left is uh, of Kathleen with a cigarette, which apparently I'm... I'm indebted to Clodagh Finn for having put it on um, uh, online recently, but it's from Margaret uh, Buckley's book, The Jangle of the Keys. And the other one, uh, Frances Brady, is when she was on hunger strike during the uh, War of Independence, how they managed to smuggle a camera in, into the jail, I, I don't know. I'd love to know more about that if anyone has information. Other women stopped their activities for a number of reasons, nervous breakdown, death of a brother, caring for young children, being forced to leave home and employment for health reasons, or for emigration due to the collapse of family business. But you can see from the pension applications that the personal toll was immense. And so when we look at the major activities of the IRA in Belfast, it's obvious from women's testimony and the corroboration given by the IRA men that they worked with that the women were integral part of the Republican offensive in the North and their experiences were in many respects different from those of their comrades in the South. I'm just sorry that I don't have more photos. Even speaking to families who know that their relatives were involved, they don't have photos of, of, of the relatives uh, coming among members. Um, the, the generation that, that, that grew up 
with the fear of internment, tended not to be open about it, tended to get rid of what they saw as incriminating evidence. And so I think we have huge gaps in our knowledge of Northern Republicanism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret, and thanks. That was an uh, incredibly detailed insight into the North, which is, you know, often excluded for very convenient reasons. Um, but yeah, I could probably tell you lots of my family histories to tie into that as well. So our last speaker um, is also, you know, an incredibly important researcher in this area, and her book on everyday violence has been quoted quite a lot of times in the last couple of days. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more of her research now on arson. So Gemma Clark is born in Manchester, educated at the University of Oxford, and she previously held a postdoctoral fellowship in Irish studies at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. She's currently senior lecturer in British and Irish history at the University of Exeter. Since her first book, Everyday Violence in the Irish Civil War, which was brought out by Cambridge University Press in 2014, she has published on sectarianism, gender-based violence and arson in outlets, including the Irish Times, Irish Historical Studies, Atlas of the Irish Revolution and Ireland 1922. Gemma is currently writing a global history of arson and has received a British Academy funding for a related project, Exporting Arson in Centrism as Protest in the Global Irish Diaspora. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Laura, for the introduction. Um, and thank you to the organizers. I know everyone said it, but um, Bridget, Mary, Owen, like professionally, it's such an honor to be asked to come and speak to this kind of audience and also to be sitting alongside all these inspiring women. Um, but also personally, it's just been a fantastic, fun conference. So thank you very much for all your hard work behind the scenes. Um, cool. So they say don't judge a book by its cover, um, but mine gives a strong hint to my research interests. Um, Everyday Violence in the Irish Civil War, which I hope is in the Kerry County Libraries alongside Thomas's, as mentioned yesterday. But um, this book has shifted the focus, uh, as some people have already been mentioning today um, and yesterday, from conventional militarism uh, to the various forms of harm and intimidation experienced by civilians. Now, this is an important perspective to take in the study of civil war, especially when, as we heard yesterday in, in Bill's keynote, territory, geography is so important to this conflict type. Civil war, by definition, um, is armed combat between two or more sides within the boundaries of a recognized sovereign entity. Um, to quote Stathis Kalavas, who's already been cited um, this weekend, violence rips through families, through communities in this type of war. And so since its publication in 2014, there's been more research, indeed excellent work by many of the people who are in this room and speaking at this conference to shift paradigms in other ways and recover uh, marginalized voices from the conflict, especially those of women, as we've just seen from those two fantastic papers. So the book argues um, that malicious burning of property, arson, was a prominent form of the thousands of acts of everyday violence that collectively served to, first of all, regulate communities, and secondly, to drive land redistribution or at least express social and uh, economic grievances. So by community regulation, I mean the punishment, and in some cases, expulsion of religious and political minorities um, to rout the newly independent free uh, state of British influence and an ongoing decolonization being needed um, in the eyes of the anti-treaty IRA, at least, uh, because of the inadequate terms of the treaty. But to be clear, and because, you know, Protestant depopulation in the Irish free state is such a contentious question, and we've been dealing with a lot of really controversial questions already this weekend and in a really um, open and respectful way, which is brilliant. But to sort of flag this from the beginning, I've shown that the religious and political minority were disproportionately targeted with acts, including arson. 19% um, of arson attacks in the counties that I study for the book, which were Limerick, Tipperary, and Waterford, 19% of these attacks were attributable to the claimant's allegiance to the United Kingdom, to quote the, the language of, of, of the sources. So these are 
this is a figure coming, coming from the compensation files that I examined, which is um, a flawed but nonetheless really valuable source base, as, as Dahi uh, explained to us yet, um, yesterday. So, of course, loyalty isn't always synonymous with Protestantism, we know that, um, but victims often self-describe in, the, in these terms, equating their politics with, with their religion, and that's something we can easily check in the census. So, it is significant that 19% of arson attacks targeted a group that comprised a small and shrinking um, percentage of the overall population. But I haven't argued ever in my book or subsequent publications that sectarianism was the main driver of Republican military activity during the Civil War. Um, so that's never been my main argument. But centenaries um, are you know, a valuable opportunity to reflect, not to state the obvious, and also to nuance past interpretations. And um, I was very lucky also to be invited last year to the West Cork History Festival, and I joined a, a panel discussing the, the Bandon Valley killings of, of 1922. So if, you, if you're interested more in this issue that I've just raised, you can, you can have a watch of, of that um, on, on the festival's YouTube channel. Uh, I gave a talk called Sectarianism as an Interpretive, Interpretive Framework. But the purpose of this talk um, is to probe further motivations for violence, sp focusing specifically on arson. Um, because despite or, I mean, perhaps because of our fundamental human bond with fire, um, we still seem to take for granted somewhat its role in, in war and revolution. Uh, from great spectacles, the burning of, of Custom House in Dublin, uh, the sacking of, of Valbriggan and, and Cork, um, the campaign of fire against hundreds of big houses, from these big spectacles right down to the small scale but nonetheless devastating attacks on modest farm buildings, crops and other property, historians seek motivations um, but rarely ask the deceptively simple question, why burn? Why, regardless of whether they have access to more advanced weaponry, do both rebel and counterinsurgency forces use fire to achieve their military, political or the goals? Um, and this is something I'm going to explore further in my um, British Academy project that Laura mentioned at the beginning, looking at arson in Ireland and its diaspora. And, you know, this is significant, I think, because fire as a protest tool, um, as an icon of resistance, and I, that's why I picked those fabulous little uh, songbooks there, um, it's a recurring global phenomenon, you know, prompted by the death in police custody of... Um, Nasa Amini recently, ongoing civil unrest in Iran, for example, seen the burning of hijabs and um, religious imagery. So that's just one example um, from many that we can think of. So I'm going to have to try and answer the question now that I've told you is, 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 is uh, simple. Um, so why burn? Yes, arson's easy. Uh, fire setting requires few tools, little expertise, and quite quickly and often irrevocably, uh, damages or destroys its targets. In their rejection of the independence settlement and campaign to stop the nascent state from functioning, the anti-treaty IRA burned barracks, public buildings, railway carriages, and undermined the infrastructure uh, via other means as well, trenching roads, cutting telegraph wires, and sometimes that could also feed into arson attacks if the, the wires were cut, uh, stopping uh, the alarm, alarm being raised. And not only were Republicans adept historically at using their surroundings to outwit uh, their opponents, uh, Justin Dolan Stover calls the Irish landscape a fifth column for the IRA, which I think is a nice way to put it. The destruction of the natural and the built environment, especially through fire, also served um, military logic. So that's the, the number of ways the geography, the, the, the outside world can be, can be used um, in a practical sense. So this idea of military rationale. So Tullamain Castle, County Tipperary, was burned by departing anti-treaty forces as the National Army advanced during the week of 23rd of October, 1922. Third Tipperary Brigade's Dambreen places the attack on this lavish hunting lodge um, in context. He says uh, in his uh, Bureau of Military History witness statement, a source base, again, we've heard quite a lot from and, uh, this, this, in this conference, he says, a policy of reprisal and counter-reprisal held sway. 
Executions on the one side were followed by counter-executions on the other side while mansions and houses of prominent supporters of the Irish Free State were given to the flames. He continues, Tullamane Castle and other Tipperary mansions had been burned in the closing months of 1922. The campaign was continued in 1923, one of the first victims being Senator John Bagwell, whose beautiful residence at Milefield was completely destroyed on January the 9th. So I've written about um, Tullamane in, in that book that I mentioned on the slide, which is a lovely, I'm not trying to push sales, but it's a lovely volume you might be familiar with. This is this, this kind of, um, uh, it look, takes the whole year and, and, and looks at one week each throughout the year. And I write about that. And I've also written about Marlfield in my first book. And um, both of these cases are fascinating examples, really, of the complexity of identity politics at this time with the attacks against the British Army Major and Master of the Foxhounds, Edward Clement Morell, who lived in this place, and the prominent Southern Unionist turned Free State Senator, uh, John Bagwell, who was from Milefield, um, explained by an interconnecting web of, of strategic, ideological, and local reasons. So um, Terence Dooley, whose work on, on the big houses is, is so, so important, he found that many more big houses so these Anglo-Irish uh, mansions, seats of colonial power, if you like, were, many more of them were burned in the Civil War than in the War of Independence, and 199 compared to 76. And these sorts of buildings also accounted for a quarter of the, of the, of the buildings burned in, in the Munster counties, the three counties that I studied. The dramatic escala escalation in burnings of big houses between the beginning of January and end of April 1923, so... Um, after the Free State's execution of four prominent Republicans in retaliation for the assassination of uh, Deputy Sean Hales in December 1922. This gives weight to the interpretation of arson as politico-military strategy. Um, by expanding my research on arson in, in recent years, like um, looking beyond the strict time frame that I had to stick to for my, for my first book, I've, I understand better that more than just a, a rebel tool, Fire also functions as um, military and state violence, which can be used selectively to prevent uh, the enemy using a particular building for shelter or barracks to destroy a, a weapons store. And, and as, as is quite typical of the Republican movement, you could, you could look at Tullamane perhaps as, as, as the uh, anti-treaty army kind of emulating uh, conventional tactics by using it in that similarly strategic, strategic sense. As a military tool, it can be used selectively, also indiscriminately, um, which is potentially more typical of this usages within state violence, by which I mean when people are collectively targeted. So you might think of the scorched earth tactics used to cut off supplies for guerrillas during the South African War, um, or during or reprisals where people are, are found guilty by association, which of course we saw in, in the burning of Cork by auxiliaries in December 1920, but also just being here the last couple of days, listening to Helen's paper earlier, so many other examples from this county that we could add, add to that list. And you know, globally, we could think of the Dutch-Indonesian War, where whole villages were burned down um, in, you know, in reprisal for attacks in, that, in, in, a particular, in a particular vicinity against Dutch forces. So in the context of free state suppression that arguably borrowed many of Britain's draconian tactics, it's perhaps not surprising that Republicans destroyed big houses as potential strongholds of a loyalist resurgence of some kind. And this idea of borrowing tactics, of sort of being you know, as bad as the British, yes, that's how it was pitched at the time in, in anti-treaty propaganda, but let's also look at the forms of violence used. You know, and we've seen that this, through the discussions this, this, in this conference, executions, the illegal reprisals that Orson talked about yesterday, and perhaps we might even add arson into this, into this category as well. I mean, um, uh, Pat McCarthy explained in a, in a great paper at last year's Civil War Conference at UCC the alleged um, involvement of the Special Infantry Corps in the burning of labourers' cottages during an industrial dispute in, in Waterford. So incorporating wider perspectives on the history um, geography and science of fire also encourages me to read deeper meaning into this form of destruction. So yes, politico-military is, is, is important, but there are these deeper meanings. Um, as an object burns, it attracts attention, and what fire leaves behind uh, can endure as 
symbols of hostility towards the target of the arson attack. And in the burning of Charles Clark's uh, Gregno Park, County Tipperary, um, we see a richly decorated home reduced to a burnt out shell in a matter of hours. Fire her, takes off the roof, leaves the walls blackened, opens up the house to the elements, and this physical and, and figurative undoing of plantation is, is captured um, very evocatively in, in fiction, um, thinking about no novels like, like Troubles, Elizabeth Bowen's writings, and, and also art, as, as I'll show, show later. Now, it's important to remember that the purpose of this attack um, on Gregno was in common with the burnings that I've studied, at least, uh, wasn't to harm Clark himself. Um, the house was in the care of a few servant uh, women, domestic servants, on the night it was burned, 28th of February, 1923, which is also a really important reminder of the disproportionate impact of civil war violence on the female guardians of the domestic space. Um, we all owe such a debt to, to Mary's work, kind of looking into this, uh, the, so the, in terms of the gender-based violence, but even if, even if it's not sexual, it can be gender-based in the sense that this is a form of violence that invades the space that's typically dominated and indeed designated by the 1937 Constitution as a, as a, as a female space. And I've written about that in, um, in Irish Historical Studies in 2020. So if you want to find any of these references, if you have a look at my staff page you can, you can, um, from Exeter, you can, you can find some of these, these, these readings. So fire communicates... Um, you know, it's not about killing, in other words, okay, in, in, in the Irish case. It communicates more powerfully than other forms of damage and perhaps even ejecting through force or verbal threats, and we see many of those in the Civil War. It communicates that the target isn't welcome in their community, which um, is seen in its most extreme form, of course, in ethnic cleansing and interracial or inter-religious inter violence, which we've seen um, around uh, the place, un unfortunately. Um, I... Explore that theme a little bit more in this blog post, if you want to have a read. Um, but, uh, Margaret's talk just then also reminds us of, of the role it played similarly in what were called the pogroms in, in, in Northern Ireland, where you do get this you know, usage of fire as this emblem of hostility, to quote the sociologist Donald, Donald Horowitz, um, and you know, the state involvement or semi-state involvement in those burnings you know, points to it to being more used along those lines of cleansing than it ever was in in the counties that I studied. But, you know, unfortunately we see this still today, you know, anti-refugee hostility in, in Liverpool involving burning. So this idea that fire sends a message is central to my wider argument on arson's evolution since the late 18th century from individual crime to collective action, from secret societies like the Rockites, um, who have written about in a 2017 chapter in Liverpool, to the Republican paramilitaries I've been looking at mainly today, individuals and groups have set fires or simply threatened to do so, often that's enough, to induce action and compliance with demands, which in turn realizes more long-term goals um, of political supremacy or social economic change. And despite the association of arson with pre-modern patterns of unrest, which we see around the globe, slave revolts, peasant resistance in Imperial Russia, anti-colonial movements in Cuba in the 1860s, Indonesia in the 1950s. Uh, I see arson not as you know, a weapon of the weak or a lacking in political meaning, but rather, you could say, on the part of those excluded from state power, an expression of new strength, which they get as soon as they light that match and perform, perform that violence. You know, fire purges the old order, as seen in the um, partially destroyed 18th century house in the background of Sean Keating's famous painting, an allegory, and it brings new beginnings. Uh, fire, flames surround the rebels in Dublin's uh, GPO, in Walter Paget's representation of Easter 16, fittingly the birth of the Irish Republic, and then, you know, we've got a uh, phoenix rising from the flames of the post office as a prominent nationalist symbol in um, a striking piece of current uh, West Belfast street art. And I just noticed in the exhibition as well, the amazing exhibition that accompanies this, uh, the whole conference by the students, um, Isel Ali Akun and their representation of the Molly O'Shea's case, who we're familiar with by now, the, the sister of George O'Shea, in that there's lots of color symbolism. And I think in the middle panel, it, to me at least, it looks like a flame representing perhaps the, the, the pain and the suffering and the, the transformation of her life due to uh, the violence that she, was in, that she was inflicted on her family. So moving beyond um, 
as, as we start to wrap up now, um, moving beyond these kind of cultural history readings of the individual big house burning and kind of trying to get uh, to, to capture the, the meanings and of of fire, you know, culturally, it's a universal tool, but also it has meaning and special significance in, in the Irish in, in Ireland and amongst Irish people. We've got to pair this, of course, with quantitative study. Um, and if we do this, I'm also convinced by the social and uh, economic explanations for burning, not only seats of colonial power, like the big houses, to access the land attached, but also thousands of other more modest homes and businesses. And it's great during this conference and this whole you know, last few years, we're seeing a lot more about the, the social dimensions of the conflict, um, especially in the case of arson, which is a nocturnal crime that leaves little viable evidence. We don't always know if the attacks attributed to the anti-treaty IRA were by the anti-treaty IRA. We don't know all the time if there was crossover between agrarian and, and Repu Republican arsonists, if you like. But um, the, the mi million and a half landless men, to quote uh, Free State Minister for Agriculture, Patrick Hogan, these million and a half landless men who were prepared to exercise their claims with the gun and the torch, Arguably, they were as threatening to the security and stability of the new state as the, you know, the more obviously political military force, the anti-treaty IRA. And the targeting of graziers is as much worthy of study, I think, as the spectacle of the big houses. So people who have kind of used, have kind of done well out of the land purchase system legislation and, and acquired larger ranches for, for, um, for pasture. The Golden Vale, incorporating some of the counties that I studied, uh, Limerick, Tipperary, was at the heart of Ireland's dairy industry and the burning of winter fodder and outhouses, which accounts for 28% of arson attacks in Tipperary, 41 in Limerick and 45 in Waterford, and other infrastructure associated with the dairy industry, such as creameries, brought serious financial hardship and uh, forced some farmers, uh, even strong you know, middle-class farmers off their land, leaving it to be redistributed with or without the approval of, of the Land Commission, which had been further empowered by the Free State's own Land Act. I include in this slide the digital mapping of the compensation claims. Um, I analysed um, an images from the images from the Atlas of the Revolution, Irish Revolution, uh, amazing publication, um, as a reminder of the importance of non-military factors, geographical, demographic, economic, in explaining civil war violence, so we can kind of ask questions when we have these, this sort of data of, do we see certain forms of violence in rural areas or urban, how far, you know, how are railways and the small pockets of industry um, that do exist, out, you know, outside the cities, often attached to the bigger states, how do they fare? And my book only really scratches the surface of this, but my, people have been doing many, much more work on this, but I do show that, you know, labour issues, for example, the firing of sawmills on the estate of Sir John Keane in County Waterford, summer 22, that the burning of commercial property, semi-industrial infrastructure was far from an irrelevant subplot of, of, the, um, of the war over the treaty. And the burning of, of these sawmills on this estate was also part of this, another example of the complexity of identity of politics at the time, because Keane was also a senator um, and his house, Capaquin, was burned, but like uh, John Bagwell, he didn't receive compensation because they deemed that he hadn't shown sufficient loyalty to Britain by taking up his free state senate seat, even though in the anti-treaty eyes, that act would mark him out for attack. So it's all kind of very confusing. So to bring us to a few uh, conclusions, we have seen... Um, First of all, the, the military functions of arson, especially within the anti-treaty war on infrastructure. We also have wider social and economic and symbolic meanings. And by meanings, as I just alluded to it before, I, I think it's important for us to think about the universal appeal. You know, we know, we know, for, we know what fire is from a young age, we know to be afraid of it, but we also see its special significance within the Irish public sphere during the end stages of a revolution against British rule and associated, necessitating associated practical and symbolic reclaiming of property, namely land. So we can look at this as, I would use the word decolonization, removing the remnants, physical symbolic of British rule, punishing loyalists who had been upholding that rule, even unconsciously. And also settle other scores, especially land hunger, but also labor disputes. 
And these logics, to use the word logic, a bit like functions, to quote Calabas, a Civil War theorist, also speak to bigger themes, hopefully shown the value of isolating for analysis a, a single category of violence, arson in this case. Um, you, could, you could look at other categories, but arson kind of adds really useful context on this million dollar question really of, of why I, sort of, the Irish Revolution and Civil War was relatively contained. Um, the scarcity of, of lethal violence compared with the targeting of property. You know, property really is key. Um, and this is an important perspective in a wider academic field that tends to define civil war by casualty thresholds. And we talked about this yesterday in terms of the value of looking at wider impacts, not just deaths and not just often deaths and injury of, of, of men, but looking at how ordinary people, and, and Dahi showed really well yesterday the impact of just losing, you know, a cow losing what you know, a motor car, the, the, the devastating financial impact that can have. So as archives continue to open, hopefully there's going to be much more to come in terms of these different gender and, and um, class readings of the Civil War, and then hope that those doing this new work with the new sources will also find my new framings of the war from a focus um, on the everyday to an exploration of the functions of fire to be, to be useful in those endeavours. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. Thank you to all the speakers for three fascinating talks. And we have a short amount of time for some questions. Is there a microphone that we can hand out? And if anyone wants to get their questions ready, I see one down here already. Yeah. Martin wants it. Oh, getting blinded by the lights up here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Gemma Clark for her talk. Um, by way of background uh, questions, I come from a County Tipperary landed family. Now, I have been in Tullamane Castle many times. Uh, it was rebuilt and beautifully rebuilt. Um, likewise, the Bagwell House in Marlfield, um, uh, certainly from the exterior, I've never been inside it, very good looking, and Sir John Keane, of course, it's in Waterford, uh, was uh, rebuilt as well. I think perhaps you would agree it's important neither to understate or overstate. Incidentally, Bowen's Court, which you mentioned, of course, although despite the very vivid novelistic description, um, I mean, it continued in existence till 1960 um, when, it was, uh, when it was pulled down. Now, I think certainly as far as the War of Independence period, um, there was an element of retaliation for uh, black and the black and tans burnt a lot of houses in towns and in the countryside. And I would draw your attention to the witness statement of Seamus Robinson, who was OC of the 3rd Tipperary Brigade, and about eight houses in the district um, where uh, our house is, um, uh, were burnt, and there was a suggestion made uh, that perhaps some big houses should, in the vicinity should be burnt in retaliation. Seamus Robinson, who was from Belfast, um, said, um, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to descend to their level. And Michael Davin, much to his frustration, um, has spent uh, the last few weeks of the War of Independence protecting um, uh, Protestant farmers in uh, South uh, Tipperary. And I think I would uh, caution, I think you should be very careful about using phrases like ethnic cleansing, because I, I'm not aware of a single member, at least historians haven't made me aware, a single member of a landed family in Tipperary who lost their life during the Irish Revolution. Now, that's not true for other counties, I'm not suggesting it is. Um, so I just think there is an element of maybe the thing was sort of brushed under the carpet for a certain period. Um, now, there was a policy decision. I mean, it's in Pierce Beasley's Life of Collins. Um, uh, in June, they decided that the War of Independence was getting very intense in its final phase, is that they would take a leaf out of the book of the War of American Independence, and they would attack property uh, rather, than, rather than people. Now, fortunately, the truce um, gave, a pause, gave a pause to that. 
And then, of course, the, the wicked irony is, I mean, I've been involved as an ex-senator myself, um, the 100th anniversary of the Senate. Um, if you were an unreconstructed Southern Unionist and didn't take part in politics, you'd be far more likely to have your house left intact than if you accepted a position in the Free State Senate, where I think the figures were 37 out of 60 senators had their houses burnt. Of course, that didn't prevent um, Senator Mark Daly Kahirlik of the Shannard uh, until December, uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Senate. And when I said, to, to pointed out the irony to, the, to him of this, um, um, uh, you know, where Republicans had a rather different attitude to the institution that he was, he, he, he was celebrating, he just rewarded me with a broad grin. Uh, <laughs> but uh, would, would, would this, could I just ask two questions of the speaker? One, would you accept that there needs to be a balance? Because there's a lot of people in this country who think half the time that, that, that nearly all the big houses in the country uh, were, 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 were burnt, which is contradicted every week by the Irish Times property supplement. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and could I ask you for an estimate, because I got two different answers from Terence Dooley, who has specialized in this area. Um, now, I know it's a very slippery definition of what is or isn't a big house. Um, at one meeting in the expert advisory group, he gave me a figure of 4%. I think I've seen published in some article 25%. Have you, have you any, any estimate at all? Um, of what proportion, uh, what minority of houses uh, were actually attacked and destroyed. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, if, ter if, Terry do if Terry doesn't know, then I'm, I'm not going to have, have a go. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a figure for that. Um, yeah, I think that it is really interesting about the, the perception. I suppose it does make a big impact because of, as I explained, the... The, the visual reminders um, and how it's captured in you know, popular culture and art and so on. But yeah, I mean, many were rebuilt and I've looked, I've seen you know, Tullamane, but I guess it's interesting the, the attitudes that this brings to the fore when we look, especially at the compensation claims and the reinstatement clauses attached and how this did s suggest a kind of shift away from this old way of life and they become used in other, in other functions. Um, and I absolutely agree, of course, that we should be really careful with terms ethnic cleansing. So that's why I would never apply that to, to the violence that I've studied. And this, yeah, that, that sort of testimony about retaliation is, um, is helpful because I found that myself in some of the accounts of, of anti-treaty burnings, a kind of almost a, a sympathy for some of these houses that had played a really important role in the community and a kind of respect offered in a sense, you know, people, and again, lack of personal violence, people were given time to get out, get the kind of key possessions. And yeah, there is this association of arson with it being a dirty tactic. And that's why I've expanded my work and looking at fire as counterinsurgency, because there was this, you know, they were using it as a, as a, a way of trying to control the population. It didn't work. When I say they, I mean the British, and they had been elsewhere in the empire. Um, but it does have this this kind of connotation of like not being a good way to fight, being with it with uh, beyond the bounds of what's expected within warfare. And we see that in in other cases around the world, like in Dutch Indonesia, where horrific things went on during that post Second World War occupation. But fire and arson, the burning of the kampongs, is labelled as extreme. It's seen to be something that doesn't. Uh, even though it does potentially achieve some military res results, it's, it's not seen as something that a proper, a proper force should be using. So that's why it's a really interesting to look at the functions and the logics of it, given the kind of associations. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Microphone's coming. Just another question for you, Jenna. You said that the, we've been hearing all weekend about the relative low body count in this revolution. Relative to other um, civil, civil wars we're talking about, how much property destruction was there in, in, in other civil wars compared to what we had here? 
or was this predominantly a property um, damaging conflict? That's a really fantastic question because normally uh, when we look at comparative, we, we, we look at the body counts because that's you know, easily measured. But um, I guess we could, you know, uh, Eastern Europe and, and Russia there would be. But yeah, not, uh, I don't have a particularly... We've all been hearing about Finland and the, the sort yeah. of massive debts that they yeah. have there. But we don't know so much about... I have to look into that one. That'd be, yeah. That would really help make my point, wouldn't it, if I actually yeah. knew <laughs> the answer to that. So, um, yeah, I mean... I, I suppose I'm I'm really highlighting property because I I think it's it's so important to Ireland as part of this decolonisation coming from this longer period of British rule and the importance of the land especially and what it means. So yeah, that would be a really great way to contextualise that further. Would be to do some. Uh, there have been a lot. There has been quite a bit of, of, of studies. I kind of I mentioned a few in my talk about kind of how fire has been used as as protest. Um, in, in an, other sort of rebellions and anti-colonial struggles, but in civil wars specifically, that would be a great thing for me to look into. Thank you so much for that Thank question. You. That's a great question. And by the way, the Spanish Civil War, there's quite a lot of that, and there's a lot of moving people into new kind of agricultural areas, so it might be somewhere to look. Yeah? There's a microphone coming over. And one more question. No, we're running over a little bit. But. Um, I'm going to give Gemma a break and give a question to, to Mary um, and to Margaret. Um, how great a role do you think immigration has played uh, in, number one, making your job um, more difficult, um, denying women referees, uh, which would support their, their pension applications, and then people not applying at all because they're no longer uh, in the jurisdiction or the jurisdiction next door? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the um, uh, pension funds for Kerry and you look at the nominal rules and each uh, branch coming them on and you look down, so-and-so's in the UK, so-and-so's in the USA. Uh, I think, was it um, uh, the, the recent research on, on the West Kerry coming them on and about 30% of them uh, had immigrated? Um, even talking about the Walsh sisters, um, there is no other reference to what happened to them than what J.J. Barrett says. As far as I can find, I'm still searching, because they didn't apply for pensions, and obviously Kathleen is in the States. Uh, and so you lose all those stories, because um, economically, uh, a lot of the coming among women, and the, the Tralee branch talk about that when they're coming back from Kilmainham and the North Dublin Union, they've all lost their jobs. Uh, and uh, unless and until they get married, they're economically in, in really dire straits. So a lot of them are immigrating. You have that single chain migration of women and coming them on are, are very much part of that. In, uh, and that's well researched and written about in, in 20th century Ireland. So yeah, we have huge gaps in the stories. I mean, probably not as extreme as among the coming them on women in Belfast because they have that other, you know, seditious documents. <laughs> Uh, their, re their applications would be seen as something that would get them in real trouble. Um, and so those gaps remain, and how we fill them is, is um, uh, just looking at the other records, at people mentioning them, at uh, reading the local memoirs, and, and sometimes we will never recapture stories. They're just gone, and, and that's it. Um, I know from some of the pension applications from Belfast that, yeah, women did go to the States, um, but we don't have the same kind of list. I know from County Down and um, Tyrone and looking at some of the nominal roles there, there's a good proportion, again, of emigration. Um, but I think for, for the North, it's that move um, across the border that, that is... Um, I don't know who's really quantified that in terms of maybe individuals rather than kind of global figures. But the other thing is women do have a problem in terms of the civil war. One woman, um, in terms of the referees, some men give very generous refer references to women, even when they are ne necessarily having taken the same side. But there are, there are some uh, where you see that the um, one of the men have said, so-and-so should 
uh, reference her, they work together, and he doesn't. Um, and it is a, a, a political thing. I mean, Roger McCauley, for example, he's always been mentioned that he should give a reference to somebody, and he doesn't. I think, the, I think about one, and he, because he became very prominent on the anti-treaty side. And not only that, but then he becomes involved in the blue shirt. So at the time when the women are applying for pensions, his politics are so different from theirs that, you know, I, he just doesn't, he just ignores them. Okay, is there one last question? Yeah, just in the middle there. Gramahagif, this Koga distant fanal and the three more Lera can want to cursive us or call on Madden Shaw. Now, I would I'd like to ask a point, and I, I wouldn't like it to be considered nitpicking. And it refers to the last statement there on, uh, by a by, uh, very good presenter, Dr. Jim Hossi, about uh, Dr. Jim Clark. And it refers to a source she used. Now, I think sources are extremely important, as we've seen here today, through the excellent books of Dear Ferris on Shea, etc., and all the publications. But you made a reference there to the, uh, to the Atlas of the Irish Revolution, a book that I bought, a very, very heavy book. I think it took, <laughs> I think it took my two hands to lift it, which is above anyway. And uh, I read through it all, and I found one glaring omission in it. Like the first thing you look at any book is the cover, naturally, and the cover is, as you know, The Men of the South by R.H. Keating, an excellent uh, painting. But I see no reference to those men of the South. And the most striking uh, part of the picture is a picture of Roger Kiley. I come from an area in Cork, Limerick, and uh, Kerry, that area, and uh, the Narcark flying column. Sean Byron is in it as well. But I see no reference to him. And while there are other splendid articles in it, I think that should be acknowledged. And coming back, the Kyrie's made a, a major contribution in Ireland. Um, one of them became Dev's bodyguard afterwards. And I had to mention there of senators' houses being burned down, a big percentage of them. And another one of them, Dan, became a senator for years. And I would like to think that uh, that could, should be corrected, since it's a major uh, front page color on a major document that costs around 70 euros and weighs about three kilograms. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I think we do you want to respond? I, I just, I, um, just thank you for the comment, basically. I, 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 I love Sean Keating's work, yeah. I, yeah, and I guess maybe right to UCC Press. <laughs> Okay, thank you uh, for the talks. We give everybody a round of applause and then have a good lunch.